Welcome back to Pod Crash number 28. Um, today we've got Danny Rowe on the podcast. Uh, she's an Olympic champion, three time world champion on the track, and uh, also a very old teammate. Oh, we've been on the <laughs> very old. Very old. I came on the wrong way, but we've been on the team together for a long time. So we've known each other for. Yeah, long time. Since you she started, I think, in British Cycling. <laughs> yeah, since I started, yeah. Which yeah. is what year? Uh, 2010. Wow. I actually want to get into what you thought, Phil, when he first locked up in the team. But um, <laughs> I'll yeah. kick off the sponsors first. So uh, we're here at the uh, Yorkshire World Championships. And, and well, at Prince of Wales Landabout, we've got a little podcast pop-up. We've got coffee provided by Lamazoco and North Star Lost, And we're also partnering with Temper, a match just like no other. And if you enter cycling, and if you enter the discount code CYCLING100, you can get £100 off a new Temper mattress. To the Dean, visit www.temper.co.uk. Wow. I might have one of those. Yeah? Yeah. Well, there's a competition going on at the weekend. Oh, I'm going to enter it. So what is it? It's just a Lollapalooza thing. So fastest man, fastest woman gets a mattress. Oh, I'm not sure about that. Maybe if I have... You do it, right, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How long is it? 10 seconds? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Oh, that's quite up my street, actually. Go on, get yourself a mattress. <laughs> is, it, is it? So are they doing a team pursuit? <laughs> yeah, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> um... Well, yeah, I, I want to kick off with what you actually thought of Phil Hines when he first locked up. Please, in the first don't place. be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think we'd be kicking off like this, but I like it. Oh, yeah, no. Well, I we, like the way we, your we podcast just, we, we go with ever. Yeah, I mean, it just cool. came to my head now, but let's, let's fuck it. Let's go with it. What did I think of Phil? <laughs> <laughs> a quiet German guy who didn't speak much English. Uh, actually, I've got a really good story that's just come you? into my head. Okay. I know, I think so I, I think it was myself... Phil and tell me if I'm wrong Phil Becky and we did like a three way dinner party oh thing yeah. come dine with come me, dine yeah. with me. Yeah, yeah. were you involved in this I wasn't who no. was it who was it was it Laura Kian 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 might have been yeah I can't remember anyway it doesn't matter so it was Phil's turn and he said I'm gonna make you a famous chicken schnitzel yeah sh mm. schnitzel schnitzel okay so I was really looking forward to this anyway cut into this chicken schnitzel and the chicken was totally raw, not oh, even cooked. Delicious. Medium rare. <laughs> Medium rare chicken. You, you didn't get the lard lasagna then? Uh, no, I didn't. That weighed an absolute <laughs> ton. <laughs> I've never used lard in my, in my lasagna. It was a translation <laughs> issue. Did, did he save you from that, that guy who you thought had a knife in the Academy Flats as well? Yeah, that's another story with Phil. So, Security Phil. <laughs> yeah, so again, cutting a very long story short, myself and Becky used to live together in the flats where we all lived in Manchester. And one night, gone to bed, and there was a massive bang. Someone had come into the flat, probably the most scared I'd ever been. And myself and Becky basically ran across the, I don't know, what was it? Like a corridor, a corridor type thing of, of the thing, flats. Yeah. Straight over to Phil and Louis Olivier's flat banging on the door phil comes to the door we say look there's someone in our flat we don't know what to do obviously the best thing to do at that moment would probably have been to call the police <laughs> phil comes out with i'm gonna get a knife i'll sort it <laughs> i had to protect his, myself <laughs> <laughs> puts his superman cape on we didn't let him go in uh, we did call the police and there was someone in our flat um intoxicated woman who'd obviously didn't know where she was going. Um, Our door was conveniently open. Um, but yeah, so yeah, we go back a long yeah. way, Phil, don't we? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's a nice little night, though, but we're not here for you, Phil. <laughs> yeah, we're here for Danny. <laughs> <laughs> so, Danny, um, you, you kind of hung up your wheels fairly recently, I guess. Yep. So, uh, talk about what life is like after cycling. It's very good. Um, yeah. yeah, I stopped professionally cycling after the World Championships exactly a year ago in Innsbruck at the World Championships. And yeah, it's been super busy since, which I'm very grateful for. Obviously, before I announced my retirement from cycling, I was a bit worried in terms of what I would do after because I couldn't really hunt for it until I'd announced my retirement because yeah, obviously no one knew about it's it. It's a funny halfway house, isn't it? Where you, like, you still want to bring in all the stuff you can get while you're current, but then you don't want to say to people you've given up and you can go full time for something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is hard. Um, I guess for a, a bit of time, you can't tell anyone. Mm. And then straight after, you're kind of, I guess it sending messages out in terms of trying to get ambassadorship role sponsorship or just looking for I guess the next thing that you're going to be doing mm. um but yeah thankfully for me I've been really busy this year which has been really nice awesome. what was kind of your decision to uh quit because you had a you were quite 
decent on the road at, um, <laughs> that year before. And, the, and there was a home world championships coming up as yeah. well. Yeah. Must have been a tough decision. Yeah, it was a really hard decision. Um, so I guess it really came from the fact that the last major medal that I hadn't won was in the Commonwealth Games. And that was a big focus for me. And I actually said, I think originally, if I win the Commonwealth Games, medal in the Commonwealth Games, which was my target, that I'd stop there and then. But I'd signed for a new team, Mariana Voss's team, Wow Deals, and I was really, really enjoying cycling. I'd invested a lot over the winter months and really trained super hard. So after the Commonwealth Games, I really wanted to carry on, use the form that I had, finish the season and see my where my head was at there. And um, so, yeah, I won a bronze medal or didn't win a bronze medal, I guess. I, I got a bronze medal at the uh, Commonwealth win Games. Win a bronze medal. Win. <laughs> <laughs> Only one winner of a bronze. Yeah, Unless it's um, the 2012 Olympics in the queue then, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, then saw the season out, did really well on the road, and then spoke to a lot of people about what to do going forward. Obviously, yeah, we're now here at a Road World Championships. But I kind of was really content with where my cycling was at. I felt like I'd achieved everything and more in the sport, and I really wanted to go out on my own terms. So I've had so many times in my career where I've been told you're crap you're not good enough two years I applied for the academy and was told no you're rubbish you're never going to make it and I wanted to go out with it being my decision I didn't Mm. want to get to the point in my career where my performance was declining I think a lot of athletes unfortunately just keep going because it's the easy thing to do and naturally when you get older I guess your performance does start declining Mm. or be forced out with an injury which sometimes also happens so I think I was in a really good headspace with the sport I was really content with what I did what I'd done and kind of weighing up what I could still achieve which essentially was Results on the road, on the world tour stage. Um, I would have been working for Lizzie Diagonan at the World Championship. So again, mm-hmm. as much as I did enjoy being a domestic, that was not going to make me carry on for another year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the Olympics as well. I won a gold medal in my home country. So mm-hmm. it was never going to compare. So I think it was the right time. And I was just ready for the next chapter of my life. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, definitely been the right decision. So talking about like people that have given you knockbacks in the past... Um, uh, one of the things I'm quite keen to talk about, I don't know if you are, is um, it, it was always quite a surprise that you had to leave or, or transition to the load uh, from the track team after 2012. I think that was, was that one of those instances where it was a bit of a push or a shove and you kind of really got yourself together and then targeted the load pretty heavily? Or? Yeah, yeah. So, well, before that, I was told I wasn't good enough uh, mm. for two years on the road. Uh, sorry, on, on the road, yeah. Mm when I applied for the academy um, and that was my first kind of real knockback where I questioned whether I would be able to make it and ultimately my dream was always to be world and Olympic champion. Um, I had so much support from my family at the time. My dad was actually a two-time winter Olympian in the sport of biathlon. Really? So we're really sporty. Did you not know? Um, No, I didn't know. Bad yeah. research on my side, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, really, you never really pushed into sport, but always supported. So thankfully at that time, you know, I was told as much as I still wanted to keep going in cycling that I would get support from my parents Mm. and from a support system. So I kept going um, and then managed to get onto the programme. And yeah, I had an amazing journey leading up to the Olympics, obviously at the Olympics. And then the event changed from three to four kilometres. And I was struggling essentially with that fourth kilometre. So I was doing a lot of training on the road and I was told that I was then... I don't like to use the word kicked off, but not on the program anymore. And in my personal opinion, it was the wrong decision. I don't think I was given enough time to kind of prove myself. Um, It was a, it was a funny time because it almost felt a little bit like it was, you know, not to get into the ins and outs of whether you justified a place in the program, but it was kind of to wake up everyone from 2012 a little bit to say that no position is safe in the program. And for you to be the, essentially the scapegoat for that felt really odd I guess at the time yeah and I think I actually brought quite a lot to the team um I was never you know I think going back to the Olympics there was four of us that went into the holding camp in South Wales and myself and Wendy Hoovenagel who was the fourth lady that didn't ride on paper were very close Mm -hmm. and performance wise probably if you'd put us down you know and told to do a 3k individual pursuit she would have gone faster so performance related maybe some would argue she was slightly stronger but what I brought to the table was that trust element that team element which was so crucial in that event yeah for sure Um, I always got on really really well with the girls um, really empathetic 
you know motivator so it was a real surprise to me and a surprise to a lot of the girls um as well so i think that's the tricky thing in that team because track cycling is an individual sport i think mm. sometimes that team kind of synergy is so important it's a really big asset oh what, yeah what you was that in when you yeah, kicked off the program. <laughs> I didn't want to say kicked off. Transitioned off. Sorry, Transition. say that again. What, what year was it in when you got uh, trans- It was oh, 2014, transition. Um, but I was given a chance to come back and prove myself. But I was given a chance to come back, not on a bike that I was on before. You know, we got kind of Olympic bikes, yeah. um, different equipment, makes a big difference. Um, no, again, no support. Um, and that was just before I had a really bad crash, or just after, sorry, I had a really bad crash on the road where I broke 10 ribs, punctured my lung. Yeah. And it was after that where then I knew that I wasn't going to get back into the team pursuit squad, but I knew that I still want, I didn't want to end my cycling career there. Mm. And I felt like I had a lot to prove. And after that crash, I actually rode a race called the Tour of the Reservoir. Yeah. And I won it and Katie Archibald was racing at the time. And not that I beat Katie, but it was just, I felt like it was a huge achievement coming back from such a major crash. And then that was when I thought, actually I could, I think I could be okay on the road. Yeah. And that was when I really turned my focus then onto the road. I had a couple of good road contract offers. Wiggle was a big sponsor in the UK, I had a really good team. Um, and yeah, that's when I turned my focus, I guess, on, onto the road. So on, on the flexion, as much as it was a tough decision to deal with at the time, are you kind of quite glad that it gave you the opportunity to see what you could do on the road? Yeah, definitely. And I always like to look back at, I guess, adversity with a positive attitude because I think it's really easy to look back and be bitter. But mm. actually, it's easier mentally to look back and say, actually, this happened because this was meant to be almost yeah. so for example the academy going back to that I got kicked off or I didn't even make it on the academy for two years but actually if I look back at the girls that were on the academy none of them actually made it so I think the fact that I could go away and be so motivated to do it on my own meant that I actually had to work harder and push myself back into the system mm. and then obviously I then got back into the squad at the perfect time, got selected to the Olympics, won the Olympics, and then didn't make it to Rio, um, when actually, again, hindsight now, looking at how Rio was, I don't know if I'd want to have wanted to have been there then, on the mm. road, especially, obviously, I didn't get selected for the road, but with everything that was going on with the Lizzie scandal, I guess, um, and then to have Lizzie my Olympic... <laughs> <laughs> To have my Olympic memory to be Rio, I'm not sure. Um, it's really interesting. Um, was, I mean, to be, to be honest, there wasn't an especially pleasant run up to the Olympic Games. I yeah. think, you know, you had Lizzie, Lizzie Gate, you had Shane Gate. Yeah, um, exactly. It's a lot of drama as well. Yeah, a lot I mean, of drama. Like, everyone went to bed at like 20 past 11 because you could get the news for the next day coming in on your phone at 11 <laughs> o'clock at night. And then you'd yeah, I remember, I remember updating day. my Twitter and really? every day there was new stuff coming out. Yeah, it was, it was quite exciting, but at the same time, you kind of wish that it would just leave yeah. as well. But, yeah. um, you know, you have to go through that stuff sometimes. But Yeah, yeah. so looking back on that, I actually think... Yeah, for me, it's nice to have my last Olympic memory as the one that mm. we won. And then I had some really, really enjoyable years on the road. I made some really good friends, you know, got to see a lot of different countries on the road. It's a lot, a lot more relaxed. I could live where I wanted to live. It wasn't scrutinized every day. You know, there wasn't that structure of having to be at the track mm. at an exact time. And, you know, you don't see daylight for the whole <laughs> day and you feel, you yeah. know, like the life been Phil. Yeah, the life's been sucked out of you. Yeah. Um, and on the road, you know, you could really enjoy riding your bike and, you know, go out and see some amazing countries in and around the mm. road racing. And then obviously the last year that I did have in 2018, I had some really, really good results. And then that was when I felt, you know, what I'm putting in, I'm actually getting back now. Mm. And I think that was why, you know, it was the right, really the right time for me. I think you've got a pretty inspiring story for a lot of athletes out there because I think, like, if you include yourself, if we look at uh, one of the, Simon Yates or Adam, I get them confused. Wasn't one on of academy. them wasn't on the academy. Adam, Adam, Adam wasn't, wasn't on academy. Yeah. Uh, the tan fields and all that kind of stuff. Like yeah. I think it shows that ultimately, you know, people used to say, "Oh, the cream always rises to the top" a little bit, and, it, and it, you do get there eventually. But it's it's not an easy load, no. I guess, when you've not got that support. No, it's not, and I'm really thankful for the support. I think I could actually get out of the bubble, and that's why I was really lucky because yeah. there were some really tough times, you know, on the track squad. I think, you know, I remember 
at the beginning of 2012 it was London World Cup and I didn't get selected for the first ride thankfully I got into the final ride and that's when we got our first world record and really turned a corner for me but I remember the weeks leading up to that World Cup I was obviously struggling struggling for whatever reason and I remember coming out of the track just being devastated you know ringing my parents or Matt and just being you know crying thinking I'm not going to make it you know we're only six months out to the Olympics and I probably i wasn't diagnosed with depression but I reckon I would have probably been depressed I remember you know I felt like I wasn't in my own body I was kind Mm. of I'd watched the telly but I couldn't take in the telly if that makes any sense I was there but I wasn't there I was sleeping a lot and it was just like quite a dark time but it was weird I got put into that final and we broke the world record and suddenly my mind just switched um but yeah sport's a a tough one and I think I all I had this inner motivation to to make it and with the support then it meant that I did carry on and I'm so thankful that I did now because I've got so much out of the sport you know not just results wise but I've learned so much you know relationships and things like that so yeah if I I always try and advise people to you know if you've got this dream and ambition to keep going because the guy that told me and I will name him Simon Cope the guy that said I was never going to make it apologized to me I remember we were at Portugal for the under 23 Europeans I believe and he was there um, as a coach helping out can't remember and we were on a road ride and he turned to me and he said which I'm really thankful for and I've got a lot of respect for him for doing but basically said sorry I was wrong but at the time everyone clung on to every word he said you know if a GB coach was telling you at 18 19 years old that you weren't going to make it that's what you believed oh yeah you just you did you know And I think I was lucky that I had, I guess, my parents and other people that had seen this potential in me Mm. because I didn't really believe in myself at the time. I wasn't one that was really confident ever as a cyclist. You know, a lot of cyclists, I think, are very sure of themselves and I'm not. Even in everyday life, I have to have a lot of reassurance for my Mm. decisions, whatever it might be, really stupid ones that, like, what I wear, I'll always (laughs) message my sister, like, oh, what what shall I get? Um, So that really knocked me, but I think because other people did believe in me, that's what kept me going. I think Um, think they're getting better with that responsibility of the weight that the coach's words can hold sometimes, because if, you know, again, that's the point I've tried to make with some of the feedback that I've given to BC a little bit, is that, you know, uh, if you're dealing with a 17 year old kid essentially like if, if you say jump they'll say how high 100% and they'll do literally anything and I think sport as a whole this isn't anything to do with BC but sport as a whole has so much potential for people who are maybe slightly abusive to thrive in that environment because they get to stay in it time and time and time and time again same with like anti-doping or like we've seen mm. in US gymnastics and things like that I think it's like, you know, I think we're waking up to that slowly that it's not just about the athletes, it's about the whole support network that stands behind them and them being on the same page as everyone else, I guess. Oh, yeah, massively. Yeah, like I said, I was lucky to have that outside, but if people don't, then I see exactly how it could spiral totally out of control Mm. because you do cling on to every word that they say when they're telling you what to do. And, you know, again, with BC, it's such a successful programme. So when you're younger... You think, well, all of these athletes are doing exactly what they're told, and mm. so that's what I'm going to do. So did, um, you, did you gain some independence when you became a road, a road rider? Did you kind of find a bit more of self-confidence, self like opinions on your training and yeah, stuff Yeah, like I did, and it was really good because I actually started being coached by Len Parker Simpson, who was Len working Simpson for... Parker. <laughs> <laughs> from I love Len Simpson Parker. Who is he? Yeah. Who is he? <laughs> so that's an in-joke. I mean, that probably doesn't have any resonance on the podcast, but yeah. <laughs> Um, and that worked really well for me. I think it's about finding the coach that works well for you. I was obsessed with numbers and data. Some people aren't. I was. Um, he's a scientist, so that's how he worked. And he's, I think he's, there's a scientist and there's a scientist. Yeah. He's yeah. definitely a scientist. He works with the uh, Chinese now, doesn't he? Yeah, he yeah. does. Yeah. There's no art involved with Len. It's just science. It is. Basically. And I love that. You know, yeah. I wanted to know why and how I was doing things, mm. and because he could explain that to me, I loved it and I believed in it. And I think that's so important to believe in what you're doing. Mm. Um, And if you've got that relationship with a coach, then I think that's half the battle. You know, you could be doing a load of rubbish, but if you believe in it, I think that's going to make, you know, it's going to work. Did he coach you up to to 2018? Yeah, yeah. I think that's the interesting thing, though. I think, like, belief is so powerful because ultimately, you know, you show up at a world championships and everyone more or less, in splinting anyway, people more or less go about the same pace. Like, it's quite fine margins, yeah. but, like, you know, let's say the top eight guys more or less do the same time. And you think their training must be totally different. 
but the belief I think is like one of the main bits behind it and not to belittle coaching but I think it, that, that's one of those powerful things it's almost like a placebo effect if you believe yeah, in what you're yeah, doing you thought you believe you achieve that is the corniest thing you've ever said. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who, who knew you were a secret motivator? <laughs> that's, honestly, that's what I used to think about. Like, if you believe, you achieve. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it is It is right, I guess. If you can believe, you can win as well. I think mm. you can. Yeah. I think that was actually my biggest downfall. Like, I remember when I was racing, Matt used to say to me before I race, back yourself. Mm. And I think it was only in the last few races that I rode that I was thinking actually I'm actually all right at this like just back yourself for Mm. once like have the balls to go out there or not balls I don't have any but you know have the confidence to go out there and and try something because you are good enough and I think that's why I got the results that I did and I guess when I started thinking about stopping you have a bit of a different mentality you've got Mm. nothing to lose you're not trying to prove yourself to anyone for any kind of contract or whatever so it's interesting I think I'm obsessed with psychology and how the mind plays a massive role in, in sport and, and ev- everyday life actually mm. um that's, that's the yeah. interesting thing like that back yourself thing just sounds like from a cyclist anyway sounds like one of the most welsh things that, that people yourself. say oh really <laughs> yeah it's like one of the sayings that you can imagine someone shouting at you who's in a welsh kit from the side of the road. <laughs> but like um you, you kind of made a steady transition towards becoming welsh i guess so what, yeah, what was very the controversially. Well, no, unfortunately, you know, we've got another guy who's changed teams here yeah. as well before. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. So the main thinking behind that, obviously, I've lived in Wales for six years. La- six mm. years now. Um, I didn't have any support from British Cycling at the time. Uh, the English squad are essentially Great Britain cycling team who are based in Manchester. The Welsh had done a lot for me in the lead up to the Commonwealth Games. So Darren Tudor used to take me motor pace in, for example, even without knowing I'd be riding for Wales. Mm. Had so much support from the support team. Um, and then basically thought, well, I'm not going to get any support if I ride for England. Uh, strength and conditioning was a big part of my training. So the Welsh Institute of Sport was 10 minutes from my house. Mm. I had that support network and I don't think that's what people realise. They thought I was just kind of, I guess... Parachuted in. Yeah, parachuted yeah. in, mm. thought, right, I can be leader or I don't know what for the Welsh squad. Um, I would have made the English squad as well. Mm. So, yeah, very different. I got all the support I needed from the Welsh team. Um, and yeah, I was an honorary Welsh girl. A lot of people thought I was Welsh even when I was... Not riding for Wales. I mean, so. like, what a time I would have presumed, yeah, Danny's probably Welsh. I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, it was one so, of these things. The, the Welsh setup's got, like, a really good vibe about it, though. Like, it's, it's, you know, you're talking about being an English writer and being helped out by Tud, Dallin Tudor, who was here earlier getting a free coffee. Um, <laughs> of course he was. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, uh, it's almost quite, um, almost, like, tribal, that little thing. There's a really close-knit community that all looks after each other. Yeah, it is. And I think Wales, as a country, is so patriotic. Mm. And I don't know whether it comes from that or whatnot, but it's a really nice team. It's professional. But at the same time, I think everyone's treated as humans yeah. and everyone's friends and the coaches will happily sit and have a coffee with you. And you don't really have that vibe in, in BC, I guess. It's a very much a coach-rider relationship. Um, so, yeah, I think everyone helps everyone out. Everyone's backing each other to win. Um, and it was a really nice place to be. Yeah, that's an, you raise an interesting point because we were talking about this at the BOA quite recently because they've got that tagline, you know, once an Olympian, always an Olympian. But it's a funny thing with with British cycling and maybe some other teams as well. Is like I wouldn't I wouldn't say once a British cyclist, always a British cyclist. And maybe being in like a Welsh setup where it's so such a close little community actually makes mm-hmm. a bit more of a difference in that sense. I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah, I've never really heard it like that. Um, I mean, I'd never heard of it either. That's why I just kind of thought of it there anyway. Um, <laughs> but let's talk about um, like what you're doing now and what you're up to now. So uh, you're kind of taking up marathon running. I believe you had a, <laughs> a pretty you had a pretty nasty accident not so long ago. Uh, as well. Yeah, it wasn't really an accident, but basically, I was really excited to start running straight after my cycling stopped. Mm. I'm addicted to exercise. I'm probably the most addicted than ever, anyone I've ever met. Um, which I'm not, it's terrible. <laughs> Where was the last time you trained? Last time I would be getting fatter. Mate, if I had some time, I'd train. I'm so busy, I keep telling you. Uh, okay. I don't actually think that's an excuse because I'm also yeah. very busy, but I set my alarm a little bit earlier to do oh, half no, an hour. No, no, like, I'm not a morning what person. What time did you wake up this morning, Callum? 9.30? Yeah, well, I was up late. I've done working. 10K by uh, 9.30. Yeah, I worked till 11 p.m. My laptop, <laughs> doing business, big business deals, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I started running um, straight after, and I think 
because I was still fit from cycling, I've you know obviously got a good heart and lungs, which wasn't good for running. So mm. every time I went out, I was trying to go a bit faster, a bit longer. And that basically resulted in me getting a stress fracture. Recovered from that, started running again, told myself I was going to take it easy. That's not in my mentality. Mm. So put Strava on, started going faster and further, and then got another one. So basically came down to the fact that as cyclists you don't even walk let alone run and well, do any no impact, impact. Yeah, no yeah, yeah. exactly like we do s and c like strength and conditioning training but it's all kind of yeah no impact just squats leg press things like that so my bones essentially weren't used to it mm. so i couldn't do the london marathon i i wanted to do the london classic so that's the london marathon the serpentine swim and ride london mm. But I couldn't do the London Marathon, but I've done Ride London and the Swim Serpentine. You've got a race coming up next weekend, haven't you? Let's not call it a race. <laughs> race. <laughs> Let's call it a sponsor half marathon. <laughs> the Wiggle Manchester half but have marathon. You s- have you set yourself a target? What time you want to achieve? Under two hours, which I think is pretty realistic. I did 10k this morning in, I think, 49 minutes. Um, and I think, yeah, that's, uh, that's slower than that pace. So as long as my bones hold up, I think I'll be okay. So yeah, fingers crossed. I'm looking forward to it. But I think uh, I think it's quite interesting to like kind of use your body in in that sense, though. I guess because we always talk about you know like uh, Katie Marchant, she came on the team and like she'll admit herself that she became like less athletic because she was a cyclist. And it's like when you see the endurance boys in the gym, it's like seeing a bit of a spaghetti to pick <laughs> I know. up a weight. You know, it's, terrible. I mean? it's just <laughs> everywhere. So it's actually like challenge yourself in that way. It must be quite you know exciting. I guess. Yeah, it's really really nice actually. And actually cycling for. I guess general fitness and I guess weight loss, let's be honest, the reason I'm, you know, exercising now is so I don't put on weight and for my own like health and mental well-being, but cycling, because you're not weight bearing, you have to do a lot of it or very, very high intense intense to actually get much out of it. So that's what's nice now. I can kind of do what I want. I've been doing these boot camp classes where essentially it's like 45 minutes of absolute savage workout but it's full body i actually think i'm potentially fitter or a more rounded i guess athlete now than i was when i was cycling because like you say when you're on a bike it's so specific and all you're good at is actually riding a bike whereas now i'm trying to do it all yeah exactly (laughs) that's the thing posture is terrible as well Um, but yeah it's just nice to do different things like obviously you're so drilled into only ever riding a bike it's, it gives you quite a good degree of freedom as well. It's like you can literally turn your hand to anything. I was going to take up rugby before I got a concussion, so that's my excuse for quitting that. Yeah, you were <laughs> going to start rugby, weren't you? I was going to give it a go, yeah. <laughs> well, Lewis Lever started it, so yeah. I thought, well, maybe I'll give it a go. I used to play. It's pretty good. That's a nice thing. You can well, no, try I, it. I, I can't. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I keep getting my arm twisted into doing like stupid. I was. I, I kind of slowly got myself out of doing London to Paris on a BMX. Oh, I did that last week. Not on a BMX. Not on a BMX. No, not on a BMX. Was it? Was it the BMX event though? No. Nope. Were you just there? No, it wasn't. It was. Um, we'd actually been as Rowan King, my coaching company, which I am going to plug on here. Um, You're welcome to plug <laughs> as much as you want. <laughs> we were coaching some Morgan Stanley employees in mm. the lead up to London to Paris. So we were just kind of motivating them then to um, I get the, through it. I coached the Glasgow office for that one. It's pretty scary how, um, how much work they had to do. It was actually, we had a WhatsApp yeah. group and a guy messaged the week before saying, just done my longest ride maybe left it a bit late 30 miles so we were doing london to paris in 24 hours as well so the second day was 200k so i think he'd left it a bit late unfortunately we we, we, i took them out for like a training ride what should have been about three hours and i reckon some people were out there for like seven eight hours like it was just i mean like it's it's good it's going to be a big challenge i mean it was a big challenge yeah but like yeah fair play to them for pushing on i mean people not when Many people not be able to finish. Out of around 300, I think six didn't finish. And that was two That was two down to mechanicals and two down to crashes. And I think it was only two that physically couldn't finish. So that was really, really good. But I was crying at the end watching them come really? in. Yeah, yeah, because I, we, I was in the fast group and we waited and waited for the... We didn't call it the slow group. We called it... What did we call it? The social group that was it the social group um and we were waiting and waiting for them to come in we were tracking them on you know live location or whatever and we all came out and 
it was such an achievement for them. Mm. You know, you take it for granted. It was hard for us. Mm. So for these people who had literally bought a bike for this event, it was massive. And I just felt really proud of them that they'd done it because it was such an amazing achievement. So what? So I guess that leads us on to the next question. Um, like, where do you get your kind of kicks as an athlete now? Is it in helping other people through coaching or like, you know, what's... Because I guess people ask me all the time. It's like, oh, you must be you know, really upset that you don't get to compete in front of a big crowd anymore or, or like, put yourself to the test. And personally, I, d I don't really feel that, no, that much. No, I don't But, like, do you, where do you get your kind of fulfillment um, from now, I guess? Loads of different things. I think mm. it's actually the variety that I'm really liking now. So, um, obviously, like I said, I'm doing loads of different sports. So I get, I'm get i getting kicks from, say, this boot camp class where I'm essentially beasting myself for an hour. I get that kind of adrenaline and endorphins that I got from training on the bike. Yeah through that and then also yeah from coaching I get a huge kick out of that so I'm coaching Abby Mae Parkinson at the moment so when she does well on the bike she's recently had a top 20 result in a world tour race you she know. was here earlier as well yeah. picking up a free coffee was she yeah, Good. Her and, and her boyfriend <laughs> and her boyfriend <laughs> was like get over this camper van Main, main, <laughs> mainly the boyfriend <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe she didn't have a coffee actually no she just picked up Dibbo <laughs> <laughs> okay. so um, yeah get kicks out of that and then doing loads of different things so for example, recently I went into uh, a PRU, so a pupil referral unit, okay. where essentially it was children that had been permanently excluded from school who mm. were in it. And I was told actually before I went in to do this assembly, you might have kids coming in and out, um, they've got behavioural, emotional um, issues, so don't be, don't take it to heart essentially if they're not going to listen. And they did. No one walked out. And I felt so happy driving home because the teacher said they literally couldn't believe it. Mm. They'd never sat like that and listened for so long. And, you know, I spoke to some of the children after and I said, oh, do you ride a bike? And half of them had never ridden a bike and they mm. must have been 14, 15 years old. And it just puts things into perspective that we're so lucky and mm. a lot of us have led really yeah privileged lifestyles so for me now to be able to give something back in that respect i get a massive kick out of mm, that's really good mm. so i think uh, we're limited on time so i'll give the the final two questions so okay. the first one is uh you know classic retirement one looking back in your career is, is the olympics still the highlight i've got three highlights okay. first world championships in apple dawn yeah which was the first time i thought yeah i can actually do this obviously the olympics take that simon cope <laughs> yeah exactly uh the olympics like obviously well. the pinnacle just, just, just to save my back there <laughs> he's a nice guy he's all right yeah. um the olympics obviously is the pinnacle of everything that i've ever done and the third was the tour of reservoir where i'd crashed four months before mm. was in intensive care they told me that I basically had broken two ribs in two places and they said if that bit of bone essentially had become dislodged and I said to them all, oh, how uh, how um, common would that have been? And they said, yeah, if you had sneezed or something like that, it probably would have come out. And they said I'd have had a 50% chance of living. Oh, so wow. then to come back and win that first race, like on paper, it's a tiny race, means nothing. But to me, it meant a lot. So yeah, they're my three. Three races I look back on with um, a lot of pride. Taking a weird one sometimes. Like sometimes... Like even if you get ill or injured, like you come back stronger sometimes. Like that enforced vest actually works quite well sometimes. Like maybe not to the level of intensive care, but you know, <laughs> like it gets there. And then, uh, so the final question would be like, what's next? Are we going to see another attempt for London Marathon and try and keep yourself in one piece this time, or like what? What's what's Danny King fitness fanatic? Danny Lowe, Danny fitness, Rowe. fitness ah, fanatic up to next? <laughs> Yeah, so loads of different things. Obviously, ambassador for a few different companies. But for now, just trying to be happy. I think that's the main thing that I'm trying to do. Um, inspire more people to get on bikes, trying to keep fit with different challenges, raise some money for in, yeah charities along the way. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Simple, okay. but happy is my motivation. Oh, fair enough. You seem to have landed on your feet, and like wish you all the best in the future. So um, this is a chance. I know you've take you've done a bit of plugging earlier, which we're very upset about. But um, if you want to plug any sponsors or shout out your social media, this is this is the time. Okay, why not? So <laughs> I'm an ambassador for Wiggle. Yep. DHB, mm -hmm. who provide very good cycling clothing, running and swimming, which I'm doing. Wow. Windy Miller, custom bike brand, mm -hmm. amazing bike. For any of you who haven't seen my bike, actually, it's really cool. So I've got the five major medals on my bike mm. in some way, shape or form. Hendy, car sponsor. 
So that's pretty cool. Zwift I do a lot with, Garmin I do a lot with, and Rowan King, obviously coaching company, we're the best coaches out there. I so. mean, leave some for the list of us. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> that's where I'm going wrong. <laughs> Find me on social media, Danny Rowe. But yeah, other than that, that's it. That's it. Be happy. Cool, yeah. That's my motto. Nice. Thank you very much for coming on. We're just going to do a final shout out to, to our sponsors, which look quite limited in comparison. <laughs> um, so we're here at the Prince of Wales and about at the Cycling World Championships. Pop down if you want a free coffee, and uh, which is provided by Lama Zocco North Starlost. And we're also partnering with uh, Temper. So if you enter code cycling100 at www.temper.co.uk, you can get £100 off a new mattress. Nice. So, uh, yeah, thanks again for coming on, Danny. I'm yeah. going to enter the competition and try and win myself a mattress. Oh, yeah, that's at the weekend. And <laughs> if you don't, you've got an amazing discount code. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually doing a lot to my new house, so I need a new mattress. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Cheeky plug there again. <laughs> thanks, right, everyone. Thanks.